Hello and welcome once again to this Red Gaming Tech video, myself and Marta, where as always I'm here with the latest news from the tech world in the last 24 or so hours. I'm going to get right into today's proceedings and we're going to start things off with some very interesting comments from Intel. Now as you guys undoubtedly know because I myself covered it the other day and of course it has been doing the rounds quite a bit on the tech uh, press websites, AMD have finally overtaken Intel when it comes to market share for the first time in years and now Intel have actually commented on this, uh, more specifically Jason Grieb, Corporate Vice President and General Manager of Cloud Platforms and Technology Group, who was speaking to an analyst at the City Global Tech Conference. So he said a couple of very interesting things, the first of which was to admit that yes, they have lost market share to AMD, but they also commented on what they've got in store for the future, because unsurprisingly, they're not just going to rest on their laurels, they are now going to be hungrier than ever to get that top spot back. And he said, quote, In general, if there is a CPU sale happening on the planet, we want to be involved in it. So we don't look at any segment of the market and say, okay, we're going to walk away from that segment or that we're not interested there. We want to aggressively compete in all segments. As we have gone through the supply issue, uh, kind of in the last six, 12, 12 months, sorry, on the PC side, we had to walk away from some low-end mobile share as well as some channel desktop share, but as we continue to improve our supply situation, we'll continue to get more aggressive there. So he didn't come right out and say, yep, hands up, boys, you know, we lost uh, market share to AMD. Obviously, they're not going to do that, but they did admit that, yes, they have lost market share in both the desktop and mobile segments. The reason for this I have discussed numerous times, and it's as with anything as large and complex as an entire market segment, it involves numerous factors, but the key ones are definitely the supply issues, which he himself mentioned, and of course, how well Ryzen has been doing for AMD. However, he didn't just talk about the past, as I kind of alluded to in my introduction to this topic. They also touched on the future as an analyst, unfortunately I do not know the fellow's name, um, asked as to what Intel's plans are for AI applications. How are they going to compete against NVIDIA, against in against them in the AI and inferencing market. And they said, quote, so our strategy on AI is pretty straightforward. We're going to start with our Xeon processor, which is our core product line. And we're going to build custom ASICs for training and inference to go compete directly against our competition. We're eventually getting into the GPU business 1.5, two years from now. And we're going to have a full portfolio of products that could service whatever AI is required. And again, from a workload perspective, we're extremely bullish on AI. We think over 70% of workloads over the next couple of years will have some type of AI. And our strategy at Intel is to have AI in all of our silicon products, from the data center all the way out to the edge, including our Movidius product lines at the edge all the way back into the data center. So we're extremely bullish about our ability to compete here and gain back share. So Intel is obviously very wise to focus so heavily on data center. I have spoken ad nauseum about how important this market is for all the companies involved. It is a huge, huge market that, of course, is only going to continue growing. So, again, AMD, Intel, and, of course, NVIDIA are all very, very focused on a data center. You know, see, AMD has got Epic now out there, and we're going to be getting Milan coming up at some point soon. Intel have their various Xeons, and NVIDIA have a bunch of stuff going on in our AI. We know they like to focus a lot on AI when it comes to their conferences. So it's definitely going to be interesting, but the main takeaway from this is that Intel is not going to stop. They're going to get more aggressive, which to be honest is good. We don't want a curb stomp on either side. We want that competition because, again, it breeds innovation. You know, AMD snipping at their heels and now finally overtaking them has kind of woken Intel up a little bit and has pushed them to put out some really good stuff that maybe they wouldn't have... not saying they wouldn't have put, out, put it out, but maybe they wouldn't have put it out as quickly or been as aggressive as they have been. We just don't know. Obviously, we, there's no way to know what they would have done if this situation was different because we don't have a mirror into an alternate universe, unfortunately. But speaking of Xeon, I actually have a bit of a leak for you next. So what we have is a listing for the Xeon W26 core 52 thread HEDD CPU. And this is for the LGA 3647 socket. 
and this is all thanks to a listing that has appeared within the Sysoft Sandra database. Now unfortunately there's no name at present, which is why I just said that mouthful just now, but it is listed as part of the i3, i5 slash i7. So, as I said, we can see the fact that it is a 26 core, 52 thread CPU, as I've already mentioned. But as you can see on screen, we can also see that we have a clock speed of up to 4.1 gigahertz. Now, it is important to note that this is the maximum frequency that is being reported by the software. But we also see 3.7 gigahertz being listed for this same processor as well. Another thing we can take away from this listing is that we see 35.75 megs of L3 cache and 26 megs of L2. Oh, and just as a quick aside, this is all thanks to it, this being spotted by the user on Twitter, Momomo, who you should be fairly familiar with by this point. We have spoken about them numerous, numerous times. So this is obviously going to be Cascade Lake or something like that in the future, but it has not been mentioned as part of the current Cascade Lake W lineup. So we're going to move over from Intel to Samsung now. So what we have this time around is some memory that has surfaced on the UK-based retailer Memory Cow, and this is a die memory. So this tells us a few things. Well, the primary thing that we see about this a die memory chip is an increased memory density per module, and bringing 32 gig consumer DIMMs along with it. So. The actual DDDR4 module that we see here, which is a mouthful of a part number, M378A4G43AB2-CVF, just rolls right off the tongue, I'm sure you'll agree, pretty much brings that, that to the table. It is a capacity dim of 32 gigs, it runs a frequency of 2933 MHz. As for the timings, for those of you who are curious, it is CL212121. Now for those of you who are sitting there going, hang on. That's not that great. I mean, it's not. Not particularly impressive. However, this is a new memory on a new manufacturing process. It needs some more time in the oven, is basically all I'm saying. So, while it's not setting the world on fire right now, it may very well do in the future. But, unfortunately, you're going to have to wait and see exactly what the ADI memory chip is capable of. And you can see the listing for yourself linked in the description below this video if you care to give it a look-see. So we're going to finish things up now with a very interesting patent from Nintendo. So we have yet another Joy-Con variant on route to us, apparently, if this is to be believed. Because, well, we have a listing which has now appeared on the official patent database in Japan. So the patent itself is legit. But as I've said numerous times, just because there is a patent filed by a company does not mean we'll ever actually see a product. Companies just file just in case they ever decide to use a design. However, there is quite a bit to see from this patent here in, in the fact that it is a hinged Joy-Con controller. So the main thing is, is the top of the controller where the joystick is on your left hand and the A, Y, X and B buttons would be on the right hand side. That top section folds down according to this new patent. The rest of the controller remains the same, it just has a bend in it, so you can either have, at least looking from it, so you've got a top bit that sort of bends at an angle, or the whole thing is more going to be more flexible, seems there's a couple of options if I'm looking at this pattern correctly, but even if it is just at the top bit folding back, it is an interesting idea. Now again, this doesn't mean that we're going to see this come to be as a real product because the main question here is what is going to be the reason for this, the advantage. You could argue that when you're holding the Joy-Cons docked on the side of the Switch screen itself it might be more comfortable to hold rather than having your hands straight up, they can sort of fold down a little bit, might make for less hand cramps, especially if you've got larger hands like myself. Obviously that has been one of the criticisms levied at the Joy-Cons is that they're a little bit small, a little bit uncomfortable to hold. So that could be the issue, it could be another issue that I'm overlooking. But let's pretend for a second that this is a real product that is going to exist. What do you guys think of the new design? Would you perhaps be tempted to purchase this new Joy-Con for your Nintendo Switch? Let me know your thoughts and opinions in the comments below guys. But that is me done for this video. Thank you so much for watching. As always, your support is highly appreciated and I'll see you next time.
Bye-bye.